All right, 19.1 is called the fossil record, chapter 19. And our goal is to describe how scientific inferences are drawn from scientific observations and then be able to provide examples to support that too. So the far side is a time machine. The guy just got out, he's ran out of gas and he's stuck in, well, yeah, he's got to go find gas before the prehistoric times. Anyhow, maybe you get it. All right, our um, objectives are first to explain what information fossils can reveal about ancient life, differentiate between relative dating and radiometric dating, identify the divisions of geologic, geologic time scale, and describe how environmental processes and living things have shaped life on Earth. So fossils, the preserved main, remains or traces of ancient life, are priceless treasures. They tell of a life and death struggles and of, and of mysterious worlds lost in the mist of time. Taken together, the fossils of ancient organisms make up the history of life on Earth called the fossil record. So how do fossils help us understand life's history? We'll be exploring that. So our first objective is to explain what information fossils can reveal about ancient life. Fossils are the most important source of information about extinct species, ones that have died out. Fossils vary enormously in size and shape, too, and also degree of preservation. They form only under certain conditions. For every organism preserved as a fossil, fossil, many have died without even leaving a trace behind. So the fossil record is obviously not complete. Fossils can be as large and perfectly preserved as an entire, entire animal, complete with the skin, hair, scales, or feathers, and they can also be as tiny as bacteria, like you might see right here, developing embryos, or even pollen grains, too. Many fossils are just fragments of an organism, teeth, pieces of jawbone, or bits of a leaf. Sometimes an organism leaves behind trace fossils, which are like cast of footprints, burls, tracks, or even droppings. I actually have some dinosaur poop in the classroom. Take a look at it when you get a chance. Just be careful with it. Although most fossils are preserved in sedimentary rocks, some are preserved in other ways, like in amber, as you can see here in this mosquito. So how does this happen? Sedimentary rock usually forms when small particles of sand, silt, clay, or lime mud settles to the bottom of a body of water. As the sediment builds up, they bury the dead organisms that have sunk to the bottom. As layers of sediment continue to build over time, the remains are, of the dead organism are buried deeper and deeper. And over many years, water pressure gradually compresses the lower layer and turns the sediments into rock. Usually, soft body structures of like skin and things quickly decay after death. So usually only the hard parts like wood, shells, bones, or teeth remain. These hard structures can be preserved if they are saturated or replaced with mineral compounds. Sometimes, however, organisms are buried so quickly that soft tissues are protected all right, from aerobic decay. And when this happens, fossils may re preserve imprints of soft-bodied animals and structures like the skin or feathers, too. The fossil, fish fossil here is formed in sedimentary rock. The fossil record contains an enormous amount of information for paleontologists. Paleontologists are researchers who study fossils to learn about ancient life. So by comparing the body structures and fossils to the body structures and living organisms, researchers can infer evolutionary relationships and form hypotheses about how body structures and species have evolved. Bone structure and trace fossils, like footprints, indicate how animals moved. Fossilized plant leaves and pollen suggest whether the area was a swamp, a lake, a forest, or a desert. When different kinds of fossils are found together, researchers can sometimes reconstruct an entire ancient ecosystem. So our first objective was to explain what information fossils can re reveal about ancient life. So from the fossil record, paleontologists learn about the structure of ancient organisms, their environment, and the ways in which they lived. Objective two is differentiate, differentiate between relative dating and radiometric dating. All right, relative dating first. 
So remember, the lower layers of sedimentary rock and fossils that they contain are generally older, of course, than the upper layers. So relative dating places rock layers and their fossils into a temporal sequence. To help establish the relative age of rock layers and their fossils, the scientists use index fossils. Index fossils are distinctive fossils used to establish and compare the relative ages of rock layers and the fossils they contain. If the same index fossil is found in two widely separated rock layers, the rock layers are probably similar in age. Pretty easy to understand there, right? A good index fossil species must be easily recognized and will occur in only a few rock layers, meaning the organism lived only for a short time. These layers, however, will be found in many places, meaning the organisms were, were widely distributed. Trilobites, a lar which are a large group of distinctive marine organisms, are often useful as index fossil. That's a picture of a trilobite. All right, relative dating is important, but more but provides no information about the fossil's absolute age in years. One way to date rocks and fossils is radiometric dating. Radiometric dating relies on radioactive isotopes, which decay or break down into non-radioactive isotopes at a steady rate. Radiometric dating compares the amount of radioactive to non-reactive isotopes in a sample to determine its age. A half-life is the time required for half of the radioactive atoms in a sample to decay. After one half-life, half the original radioactive, radioactive atoms have decayed. After another half-life, half -life, another half of the remaining radioactive atoms will have decayed. Different radioactive elements have different half-lives, so they could decay at different rates. The half-life of potassium-40 is 1.26 million, billion, I'm sorry, billion years. Carbon-14, which has a short half-life, can be used to directly date very young fossils. Elements with long half-lives can be used to indirectly date older fossils by dating nearby rock layers or the rock layers in which the fossils were found. Carbon-14 is a radioactive form of carbon naturally found in the atmosphere. It is taken up by the living organisms, let's see, yes, here we go, taken up by the living organisms along with their regular carbon, so it can be used to date material that was once alive, such as bones or wood. After the organism dies, carbon-14 in its body begins to decay into nitrogen-14, which then escapes into the air. Researchers compare the amount of carbon-14 in a fossil to the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, which is generally constant. This comparison reveals how long ago the organism lived. Carbon-14 has a half-life of only about 5,730 years, so it's only useful for dating fossils no older than about 60,000 years. For fossils older than 60,000 years, researchers estimate the age of rock layers co close to the fossil-bearing layers and infer that the fossils are roughly the same age as the dated rock layers. A number of elements with long half-lives are used for dating very old fossils, but the most common are potassium-40, which has a half-life of 1.26 billion years, and uranium-238, which has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. So, to review here, our objective was to differentiate between relative dating and radiometric dating. So relative dating allows paleontologists to determine which, whether a fossil is older or younger than another fossil. Um, and radiometric dating uses the proportion of radioactive to non-radioactive isotopes to calculate the age of a sample. Moving on to objective three then. Identify the divisions of the geologic time scale. All right, here they are. <laughs> I'm not going to make you memorize all the minor ones, but just some major ones, okay? Geologists and paleontologists have built a timeline of Earth's history called the geologic time scale. The basic divisions of the geologic time scale are eons, eras, and periods. So you have eon, era, and a period, all right? 
By studying the rock layers and index fossils, early paleontologists place Earth's rocks and fossils in order according to their relative age. They notice major changes in the fossil record at boundaries between certain rock layers. Geologists use these boundaries to determine where one division of geologic time ended and the next began. Years later, we are radiometric dating techniques were used to assign specific ages to the various rock layers. The time scale is based on events that did not follow a regular pattern. The Cambrian period, for example, right here, began 542 million years ago and continued until 488 million years ago, which makes it 54 million years long. The Cretaceous period was 80 million years long. Ge geologists now recognize four eons at unequal length. The Hadean, Hadean eon, all right, which I kind of try to find a picture for you guys, during which the rocks first formed began about 4.6 billion years ago. The Archean Eon, all right, you can from the Archaea, I would think from the bacteria, when life first appeared began about 4 billion years ago. So the Hadean, Hadean, Archean, right there. Moving on, we have the Proterozoic Era, began 2.5 billion years ago, right here, right here, sorry, and lasted about until 52, 542 million years ago. Underwater, hey, whatever. And then the Phanerozoic era, <laughs> excuse me, began at the end of the Proterozoic and continues to the present. Okay? That's all our time right here. Eons are divided into errors. The Phanerozoic era, eon, for example, is divided into Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras. Here you go, right along there. Errors are, <laughs> er, errors, eras, yeah, whatever. Errors are subdivided into periods, which are arranged in length from nearly 100 million years of years to just under 2 million years. The Paleozoic era, for example, is divided into six periods. Geologists started to name divisions for the time scale before any rocks older than the Cambrian period had, had been identified. So, for this reason, all of geologic time before the Cambrian period is, is simply called the Pre-Cambrian period, or time. The Pre-Cambrian time actually covers about 90% of the Earth's, here you go, history. In this figure, the history of Earth is depicted in a 24-hour clock. Notice the relative length of the pre-Cambrian time is almost 22 hours. So our objective is to identify the divisions of the geologic time scale. The geologic time scale is based on both relative and absolute dating, and the major divisions of geologic time scales are eons, eras, and periods. Objective 4 is describe how environmental processes and living things have shaped life on Earth. Earth and its climate has been constantly changing, and organisms have evolved in ways that responded to those new conditions. The fossil record shows evolution histories for major groups of organisms as they have both responded to changes on Earth and how they have changed. Climate is one of the most important aspects of the Earth's physical environment. Earth's climate has undergone dramatic changes over time. Many of these changes were triggered by fairly small shifts in the global temperature. During the global heat wave in the Mesozoic era, Earth's average temperature was only 6 degrees Celsius to 12 degrees Celsius higher than they were during the 20th century. During the Ice Ages, world temperatures were only about 5 degrees cooler than Celsius than they are now. These relatively small temperature shifts changed the shape of life on Earth. Geologic forces have transformed life on Earth, too. They produce new mountain ranges and moving continents. Volcanic forces have altered landscapes and even formed entire islands. Hawaii. Local climates are shaped by the interaction of wind and ocean currents in geological features such as mountains and islands, which we just talked about this back when we talked about ecology too a while ago. 
The theory of plate tectonics explains how solid continental plates move slowly above Earth's molten core in, process, in a process called continental drift. Over the long term, continents have collided to form supercontinents. These, later, these supercontinents have split apart and reformed. Where land masses collide, mountain ranges often rise. When continents change position, major ocean currents change course. All of these changes affect both local and global climate. Continental drift has affected the distribution of fossils and living organisms worldwide. As continents drifted apart, they carried organisms with them. For example, the continents of South America and Africa are now widely separated, but fossils of Mesosaurus or semi-aquatic reptiles have been found in both South America and Africa. The presence of these fossils on both continents, along with other evidence, indicates that South America and Africa were at one time joined together. The activities of organisms have affected global environments. I'm sorry, I skipped a spot. Evidence indicates that over a million years of been millions of years, giant asteroids have crashed into the Earth. And many scientists agree that these kinds of collisions would toss up so much dust that it would blanket the entire Earth, possibly even blocking out enough sunlight to cause global cooling. This could have contributed to, or even cause, worldwide extinctions. Dinosaurs. Anyhow, the activities of organisms have affected global environments. For example, Earth's early oceans contain large amounts of soluble iron and only a little bit of oxygen. During the Proterozoic era, eon, for example, however, photosynthetic organisms produce oxygen gas and also remove large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the removal of the carbon dioxide reduced the greenhouse effect and cooled the globe. The iron content of the ocean fell as the iron ions reacted from oxygen to form solid deposits. Organisms today shape the landscape by building soil from rock and sand and cycle nutrients through the biosphere. So objective four describe how environmental processes of living things have shaped life on Earth. Building mountains, opening coastlines, changing climates, and geological forces have altered habitats of living organisms repeatedly throughout Earth's history. In turn, the actions of living organisms over time have changed conditions in the land, water, and atmosphere of planet Earth. To review, our objective is to explain what information fossils can really be about ancient life, differentiate between relative dating and radiometric dating, identify the divisions of the geologic time scale, and describe how environmental processes of living things have shaped life on Earth. Our overall goal was to describe how scientific inferences are drawn from scientific observations and provide examples. I think I've given you a plethora of examples. And do I have a picture? Oh, I'm so sorry. So, so sorry. Go look at me. Bye.